Something happened at the start of 2016 that stopped us all in our tracks. David Bowie died. At first, the information was hard to take in. Surely not Bowie. He'd only just released an album two days before. Spontaneous Bowie tributes appeared around the world. Not since the shooting of John Lennon had the death of a pop star provoked such a response. And then just... When David Bowie first performed on mainstream television in 1972, it seemed like he'd dropped out of space. When you see him do Starman on top of the pops, he looks amazing, the song is amazing, it's full of colour at a time when life seemed black and white, it's full of mystery, you can't work out where it's come from, he might have come from another planet, he's definitely singing about another planet. David Bowie basically said, here's the future, I am the future. In fact, David Bowie had been building up to this breakthrough moment for many years. He'd released his debut album back in 1968. We have a young man called David Bowie, and he wants to be a stage singer. He wants to be in a musical. His, his idols are not Jimi Hendrix. He liked people like Anthony Newley, uh, Lionel Bart, when I live my dream, I'll take you with me Riding on a golden horse His first album, about half the content was music theater. Everyone thought he was a, a great talent, but he seems unfocused. Check ignition and may God's love be with you Bowie and Visconti collaborated on a folk rock album which produced Bowie's first top five hit, released to coincide with the moonshot in 1969. Now it's time to leave the capsule if you dare. Space Oddity seemed destined to be a one-off novelty record, so Bowie tried a heavier rock sound and used shock tactics to try and get noticed. When I first met David, I could feel the considerations that he had about being a one-hit wonder. In the early days, I was struck by this determination that was there. Um, although he hadn't figured out exactly what he was going to do and how he was going to do it, David had no boundaries as far as taking on influences. He's prepared to say and do anything to get the attention. When I saw the cover of The Man of Solar World, I thought David lost his mind. <laughs> you know, why are you wearing a dress, David, for God's sake? <laughs> Bowie kept trying new styles, and his fourth album, Hunky Dory, showcased his versatility as a songwriter. It doesn't sound dated. It exists in its own zone, in the way that the Mona Lisa does, or a, a Picasso. John Rowe, he already had that iconic personality about it. He played with his face, and he played with his personality, and he played with his body. You know, he could move like both a woman and a man at the same time. And anyone gay would have found him incredibly comforting. Bowie would spend an hour and a half getting ready, getting the Ziggy makeup on, the clothes. He's getting ready as Ziggy, he's on stage as Ziggy. He comes off, he's got an interview to do, and they didn't want to talk to David Bowie, they wanted to talk to Ziggy Stardust. And it was a pretty powerful character that he created. I, I, I'm very much a character when I go on the stage, I feel. I mean, I, I... Like an actor? Yeah, I believe in my part, all the way down the line, right the way down. 
but it, I do play it for all it's worth because that's the way I do my stage thing. That's that's part of what Bowie's supposedly all about. I'm, a, I'm a, an actor. The fame came quickly, but so did intense pressure and addiction to cocaine. I realised that it was taking over from Bowie. So when he finally killed Ziggy, it was actually a good thing, because Ziggy would have killed him, I think. After less than two years, Ziggy was dead. He's constantly moving. In two or three years, he's Ziggy, he's Aladdin insane, he's the thin white duke, he's a young American, and, and that becomes part of his entertainment, which we, we as, as fans, were finding incredibly exciting, because you never knew where you were. He can take on so many different personas within one, even just one track. I think as a singer as well, you know how, actually how really difficult that is. It's not easy. I mean, in Young Americans, he does all these kind of voices throughout. There's like the theatrical voice, but almost verging on Elvis. The bills you have to pay. And then there's the faux black vocals, you know. You ain't a purple, you ain't a horse, uh, he even does that kind of snatchy, like, my God. But it doesn't sound like somebody trying to impersonate a soul track. It sounds like completely his own take on it. And if he sounded more American, I think the music would mean less. I think it would feel, I think it would make you feel less. His phrasing, and I mean, it's so soulful. Like, where, where did that come from? He's an artist. He's, he's got the canvas, he's got the colors, he's got the scenery, and he just puts it together. And for me, that's his real genius. David just had this amazing fusion of mixing basically, you know, New York R&B with, you know, German Expressionism. In 1976, Bowie relocated to Berlin, where he worked with Iggy Pop, Brian Eno, and Tony Visconti. Berlin's a cool city. A lot of artists live there. You would see big tanks going down the main street followed by another three big black tanks with a gun in the front, you know. That's what it was like in Berlin in those days. Very exciting, actually. He walked through Berlin unrecognized, or if he was recognized, they left him alone. It created a, a very fertile period for David. What he goes and does is he hires his African-American rhythm section to come from New York to sit in Berlin and add what they do well to all this Germanness, or <laughs> he's surrounded with. Only David Bowie could pull off something like this. The Berlin period produced one of Bowie's most famous songs, now regarded as an anthem of human triumph. Heroes had more ambiguous origins. Heroes entered the world at the time, almost like weary and forlorn, like a strange hymn. Who is it about? You know, it might well be about David Bowie's love for Romy Harg, you know, his transsexual lover in, in Berlin. But Bowie is infinitely interpretable, and every song he's ever written is always open to interpretation, and that's what's wonderful. The world is trying to wrestle this extraordinary piece of music to the ground and say, this is what it's about. It's about triumph. We become heroes just for one day. I remember for uh, the 9-11 television show that they had in New York City, Heroes was very much the anthem for the firemen. And David said, he said, you know, I wrote this about an alcoholic couple. And he goes, uh, uh, basically a guy like uh, shaking his hand at God, and 
saying like, I blame you for everything that's happened to me and all that, you know. He had no intention of writing it as a heroic anthem, you know, to, to be played at such events as 9-11. But the chorus will prove him wrong. The, you know, we can be heroes just for one day. Everyone has the potential to be a hero. You know, like songs change their meaning over time. A song like that will always be a classic. It's just such a great, great song. Bowie never stuck to a winning formula, and by 1980, he was re-evaluating and casting off his past. Artist of all time. It's this ability to look back on himself. It's two ashes. And I remember when he started singing the lyrics, I got goosebumps because he was making references to Major Tom. Like he was trying to put Major Tom to rest with that song. Almost everyone else had caught up. The Madonnas, the Morrises, the Boy Georges, the Pet Shop, you know, so many people, the Princes, they'd all caught up. They'd all got in on the act. And because they all got in on the act, then it was boring to him. So, you know, he goes somewhere else. He appeared in movies, plays, became an art critic and a pioneer of the internet. And then he seemed to retreat from music altogether. I wanted to be a musician because it seemed, um, it seemed rebellious, it seemed subversive. It felt like uh, one could affect change. It had a call to arms kind of feeling to it. This is the thing that will change things. It still produced signs of horror from people. If you said, I'm in rock and roll, it's, my goodness. Now it's a career opportunity. And the internet is now, uh, uh, carries the flag of, of being subversive and possibly rebellious. Then, in 2013, after a 10-year absence from music, Bowie suddenly released a record without any warning. The lack of promotional hype turned out to be a powerful way of drawing attention. Had to get the train. The same year, Bowie opened up his archives for a massive retrospective at the v &A Museum in London. I think he was very aware that the exhibition would be important, it, it, almost in, in terms of taking control of his legacy. It's almost like he set up the information, his history, his, his archive. Uh, the essence of himself filtered through his own kind of body of work so that when people started to remember him and think about him and talk about him and start creating that posthumous uh, legacy, he'd, he'd supplied the material, he had been in control of it. The, the posthumous life of David Bowie is where it all really starts to make I I an incredible sense as it enters history. I guess we're, we're seeing in its rawest state uh, the imagination at the end of a life and what's beginning to happen and the shadows that are taking over and the fear and the desperation. So he's not giving us a conventional show business performance. He's given us the performance of a lifetime. You know, uh, we all know we're going to die someday, but he was able to verbalize it, to actually say what it feels like. He was just looked everything full on, didn't avoid the issue, and had the talent to articulate these things. He was thinking very explicitly about death and folding that into his material, but he was also still considering the idea of, of performance. He was a master of, of great entrances and then also wanted to be a, a, you know, the master of a great exit. You know, there's something about him that will always be timeless. As long as there are human beings, David Bowie will always be popular. <laughs>